Okay. So uh, today's agenda is, as I said, a little bit different. We're, um, we're talking about this as a bit of an open house. Um, we've gone through a lot of material over the last 12 weeks, and we wanted to take an opportunity to pause for a moment, have a little more conversation, uh, and to reprise some of the topics and provide some updates, and then talk about where things are headed moving forward. And so what we'll do here is I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the NIC and purpose and mission again, just to kind of re remind people of that. We have some new people on the, on the call here today, I know. Uh, and then we're going to go through uh, an update, which we weren't, didn't have time last week to go through because the education presentation was so robust that uh, we, we got deep into a conversation. So we're going to report out. We're going to have uh, Dave and Pradeep and other folks who are uh, who have been working, a whole group of folks been working on this person matching work group, which is the first work group that we've created as part of the Let's Get Technical. And we'll provide you an update on kind of the, how the group is working and then what the, what's, what's happening and where we're headed on that. Uh, and then throughout that, uh, we'll have conversation and questions because it actually raises a bunch of topics and a bunch of, um, uh, a bunch of uh, areas that are, I think are relevant to Let's Get Technical altogether. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll briefly do sort of a, just kind of a snap overview of the couple of the topical areas that we've gone into somewhat more depth on recently. One is the data exchange standards, uh, the trusted exchange uh, framework and agreement, the TEFCA, and education briefly. Um, and we'll talk a little bit. We started to put together a, a calendar of events for the next couple of months just so that people can begin to get a sense of where we're headed. And, and what we would like to do is we'd like to actually open that up and um, ask folks what other topics they're sitting on or that you're aware of that, that you'd like to either present or, or for us to present about. Um, so um, with that, uh, let me say uh, for new people who are on the call here, uh, there's 28 people on the call. I'm just going to take a moment here. And if you um, uh, want to just introduce yourself uh, briefly, you can just write your name into the chat, and we'll call on you briefly to say hello and where you're from. So, Barbara, I think you uh, are been here before with us, right? Yes. Welcome. Uh, Jeff, say hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Jeff. Went with CMA. We're a systems integrator. Uh, located in Albany, New York, <clears throat> and the prime contractor for New York State's Medicaid Data Warehouse. Thanks so much. Uh, Melanie, welcome. Hi, this is Melanie Epstein Corbin with the California Department of Public Health. I am the coordinator for electronic case reporting here in California. That's great. Uh, wonderful. Welcome, Naresh. Hey, this is Naresh. I'm from Utah, and I work on control substance data as a senior informaticist. Oh, great! Welcome. Uh, anyone else new to the uh, to the call here? Just put your name in the chat, and we'll follow you up. I think this is the way we've discovered is the most effective way of doing this. Okay. Well, welcome to everyone, and uh, thanks for folks who are returning from the call. Uh, from prior calls, um, let me just start with a couple of a uh, couple of topics here. Um, one of the one of the slides that's up here, which uh, uh, which you'll have in the deck as we uh, as at, which we po which we post after the conference or after the call, is something that got created in uh, San Diego uh, last spring when we were working there, and the whole concept of the let's get uh, technical actually really kind of got started. And this was a, a working session that we had around uh, kind of where, uh, where the field was going. And one of the things that came out of this on the right side of this really had to deal with, uh, you know, speaking the same language. I think one of the, a lot of the voices we had is, are we speaking, uh, are we speaking in languages that other people in other domains can hear and understand as we look to develop uh, robust uh, systems and approaches to interoperability and data sharing. And I, as I was looking through the, uh, some of the murals we had, I thought this one really represented, in many ways, the core of what we're doing here, or what we're attempting to do here with the Let's Get Technical group. And uh, by that specifically, um, you know, the Let's Get Technical is part of 
the National Interoperability Collaborative, which is a community of networks. Um, and the mission, of course, is to improve systems, increase collaboration among the sectors that enhance safety, health, well-being, education by, by advancing information sharing. And it's interesting that to, uh, this week is actually our first anniversary of really having the, the hub up and, and running, which we're calling our hubversary. And some of the stats below kind of give you a sense of the participation. So there's over 800 members who've joined. Uh, there's over 80,000 page views, 12,000 visits, and a very high level of engagement, and a bunch of resources, close to, close, uh, uh, approaching 900 different resources that have been contributed by, uh, by participants in the, on the calls and, and by our team as well. Now, the, the core point here is that um, the NIC is, um, is really attempting to go across uh, domains. Uh, clearly, there, there's you know, a ton of work going on in health and human services and public safety and education, and a lot of expertise, a lot of experience, a lot of, uh, a lot of history of developing and optimizing solutions. Um, but what is uh, lacking to a certain degree, and that's been emphasized by a number of calls, is the, the cross-domain collaboration. So how does social and health work together? Uh, how do social and health and public health and education work together? And it's that, it's that edge of working across the domains which appears to be uh, both unique and also particularly exciting for folks in the conversations we've been having as we've explored um, uh, the standards conversations, as we've explored the application and the implications of new uh, national policy or federal policy that's coming down, uh, and all as well as uh, things like we're going to hear about momentarily, such as uh, person matching. So how do you do person matching uh, within a domain, but importantly, how do you do it across domains? And um, uh, and that is that is a question that it seems to be galvanizing people's attention and interest. And and we started to do that. Uh, we started to articulate that a, a couple of years ago under a paper we wrote for Hims which is off here to the right side you can click on, it really looks at these six domains and begins to look at the commonalities and differences. And so that in many ways is um, what I like to call sort of an unnatural act, right? People are busy enough trying to work within their own domain. And I think the real value proposition in many ways is our ability to begin to think across those domains. And our experience so far has been fruitful and it's also really highlighted some of the challenges. Uh, simply speaking, the vocabulary of another uh, of another domain is is challenging enough in terms of what we even call it, whether or not it's a client, a patient, a consumer, or a customer, or just a person, as we've chosen to refer to the person matching kind of approach here. Um, and and that's one of the things that really, I, in just a moment, we'll we'll sort of transition to the uh, person matching group, and they can art we can they can articulate uh, you know the kinds of challenges as we're looking across those, uh, those domains. And so that's a place that I think we really want to uh, be paying attention to. I'm noticing a, uh, a, a note on my, on my Zoom that's looking like I may have lost connection here. Um, uh, and let me know if that's true for folks. I still or, hear, uh, hear your audio. I still hear your audio, yeah. Daniel, but I just get a black screen. Okay, so I don't have any more slides to show. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, try to uh, relaunch the, 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 the video portion of this. But let me turn it over uh, uh, to both Dave Walsh and Pradeep uh, Padilla and hey, Daniel. Well the rest of the team. Yeah. Hey, Dave. Uh, hey, uh, just because we're, we're transitioning to Dave and uh, I'm pretty good friends with Dave. So this is Kevin Driscoll. Hey, we joined last week. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm happy that you guys have invited us. But I just want to let you know, we, I had my chat window was screwed up, and um, I've got my guy from that's heading up the like the education domain for um, Dave and I um, on. Okay. So Brian, if you could just introduce yourself real quick. Uh, yeah, like Brian, I mean, Brian. basically, Kevin just said it. Brian Brown. Um, I'm out of Atlanta, um, and I do the education piece for uh, Concrete AI. Okay, great. Uh, so Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, that, I just want to take the opportunity to. You know, I know we were looking for some more people, so. I yep. thought it'd be good to bring Brian in from a domain of education, if you don't mind. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll 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 jump to that momentarily. So, uh, Dave, Pradeep, you may want to introduce the other team members, and then uh, 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 let me see if I can pull up your your page while you're doing the introductions here. 
Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Happy Friday, everyone. Good morning. And the other team members are um, other team members of the client or patient matching work group or the project group are uh, Daniel uh, Stein, uh, Dave Walsh, Adam Pertman, Marcelli Hancock, Rita, Noam, Brian, Eric, Neil, Helen, Tim, Ford, Lester, Larry, and Paul. Dave. So, uh, so the team has been uh, meeting uh, frequently to identify and flesh out what what would be an ideal product that comes out of this patient or client matching because there there has been much literature when it comes to patient matching and client matching but we were trying to identify what would be a good product i mean what would be a good product as well as how could we make a better use of the time of all the people who are joining the call and taking time out of their busy schedule so we have been talking about some possible products so we're trying to keep it like a question and answer kind of a thing. So I'll get started. So, so, uh, so team, uh, what do you think would be a good product that could come out of this work group? Any, any, any thoughts? Well, I'll, uh, this is Dave Walsh, uh, Pradeep. I'll, I'll go ahead and get some of the conversation started. Sure. Uh, you know, once we started this person matching effort, it became obvious to us that it's really a little di quite a bit different if you're looking at uh, person matching within a repository of information. So being able to look at database records and so forth. But as you start to look at the issues that we're trying to resolve, in the let's get technical specifically cross domain, the issues of cross domain name matching uh, come up. And as of yet, I haven't seen, um, you know, the, the, the golden egg there. I haven't seen where, hey, here's the way everybody's going to do cross domain matching. So one of the things that we have started doing is reaching out into uh, other uh, domains. Uh, specifically, I have a background in healthcare. So as uh, initiatives like fire to exchange information become more and more of a focal point of the healthcare domain, they have got the problem of cross-domain matching, but I have not yet heard, here is the single solution. So what I'd want to encourage is if people on this call, either now and really appreciate it now, or into the future, see potential uh, approaches to cross-domain name matching, I'd love to hear about that. We all would. So um, this is Mary Sarah Jones, and I'm I'm from IBM. We are doing that with a couple of clients, and in Sonoma County, we are bringing together um, Neem and Fire, um, so that we can do that cross industry standards. So we've got the AHL7 data, we've got the social programs, the human services data, um, and we are doing the identity resolution based upon specific attributes um, that are relevant within the different systems. So we, um, we're we also doing that in um, San Diego and a couple other projects. So um, I'm happy to give you more information on that if you're interested. Yeah, I'd be very interested. And one of the things that uh, uh, we've talked about in the past is kind of a repeating pattern of um, uh, cross-domain issues and then specific domain presentations. So maybe one week it would be about cross-domain issues, things are in, that are in common between the domains. And then uh, like last week and a little bit this week, uh, 
focus in on one specific domain. This time happens to be education, but would love to talk to you about that and what you're doing. One quick question I have for you right now, and uh, that is you all are familiar with FIRE as well, true? Yes, that is correct. So, uh, you know, one, one of the initial questions that I have is, it would seem like in a uh, fire-oriented architecture, you would, uh, you would be hitting this problem on a regular basis. Do you see any standards coming out associated with fire or for cross-domain matching in general? Do you see standards coming out for that? So um, we're using FIRE and NIEM, N-I-E-M, the um, mm -hmm. National Information. Yeah. So we're using both of those um, uh -huh. a, and kind of harmonizing them in order to address the cross-domain issues. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I think even a little bit later in this discussion, we're going to talk a little bit about NIEM and FIRE and the cross-domain aspects there, but anything that you see in terms of cross-domain name matching, I'm sure Pradeep and the rest of the team would really appreciate insights on that. All right. I'm, I'm happy to provide lots of information and we can get um, the architects on the phone if you want um, to, who can dive into it really deep. Yeah, and this, is Brian, this is Brian Hansficker. I'm the technical lead for the Neem Health community of interest. And one of the projects we've been working on over the past year is uh, defining a mapping between HL7B 2.5.1 and FIRE uh, resources and uh, Neem elements uh, with the intention of ensuring that there was a standard mapping that was available to all comers. And I would love to see what uh, your architects have done um, with their internal mapping. This is Carmen Smiley from ONC. I would also really love to see what you guys have done. Thanks. Very sorry. That I'm, I'm assuming you're talking uh, about, um, um, oh my, I just, uh, I'm sorry, I just spaced his name. Um, uh, the architect who has been in San Diego. Um, the bunker. That's Subankar, Subankar, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Subankar was on an earlier call, and uh, you know, it was it was very helpful. I'm assuming that, and I know there was a lot of energy. We had had a couple of calls on this, so that that will be fantastic. And he was very helpful in describing some of the challenges uh, of of sort of linking uh, or, or doing what you're talking about between both fire and neem. So I don't think that conversation has been resolved. Um, um, and so um, I, it'll be a, a really important topic because we dive more deeply into it, I think, and it keeps coming up in different places. Uh, and and it, I'm curious about other folks on the call, um, if, if you're here, if other folks are hearing that, uh, particularly from the social services side uh, and also the health side on HL7 and NEAM, is that a conversation that other folks are hearing of how they live together or not? Uh, no, I'm arts here. I don't. I don't know if I have a direct answer to that question. But but one one thing that that strikes me about the, the conversations that we've been having, we've been talking a lot about neem, a lot about fire. Um, you know, if 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 we're talking about patient matching or linking specifically, it was most of these standards efforts really don't address it directly. So yes, we, 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 uh, a prerequisite to appropriate matching is figuring out what data elements you might use to match across systems, across domains, across whatever. But, 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 but most of these standards-based activities still look at the matching, self, uh, the matching set itself essentially as a black box, meaning I throw some stuff into some magic matching engine and it then tells me if these two patients or clients or, or residents or whatever are the same. So I, I think we, we need to get our, our, our expectations 
in the right place, that these standards efforts at best will help us align those data elements that might be used as inputs to a matching um, exercise, but they don't typically address the matching itself. Right. And I've been unclear right. on what our, our, our matching group is, is, is really wants to, to talk about and so, tackle. Um, so what we found, though, is that when you look at the matching, you're right. You've got to look at the data aspects of the systems that you're bringing together. And it's not just about domains, it's, it's actually about unique systems because even within um, social programs, there's no, I mean, we don't have any standards. So um, when you understand what data is trusted within each of those systems, what's going to be accurate, what's not going to be accurate. Um, so, that, so it takes a little bit of dissection, if you will, um, and diving into it, and then using those attributes of the individual that are going to be most relevant for those systems and allow you to bring it together. And we typically do a deterministic, um, I mean a probabilistic um, approach as opposed to a deterministic approach to the matching. So you have to establish your level of um, accuracy and um, and there is some fallout, so it's not perfect, um, but we're able to get it high enough that it's um, that it works for the clients. So we can talk about kind of how you determine those attributes if you'd like. Um, Sabanker is the right person to have that discussion. I That's guess great. one. Great. So this is Dave. I guess one of the questions that I have is as. Uh, certainly healthcare is going to a um, much more distributed uh, server, fire-esque kind of an approach to things. Are there standards? Because I think that, and Serbanka can probably talk to this very well, there are ways that he can do that if he is the owner of those endpoints if he's the owner of those systems it gets a little more complicated if you take a scenario like schools where somebody is transferring school districts transferring states and so forth to be able to uniquely identify in both of those uh, uh, jurisdictions that we're talking yeah. about the same individual so go ahead yeah, yeah, no, um, we don't, uh, he doesn't own the endpoints in any of them. So we, um, that was, has always been one of the um, requirements is that the legacy systems don't get changed. They're managed by different entities um, and there's no updates to that data. So it stays as messy as it is. Um, so yeah, it, it is, it is complicated, um, but there are approaches, there are approaches that work. That's great. So I'll, I'll be reaching out to either you or Sabanka okay. to try and uh, get more information on it. Great, great. And Daniel, I've got to drop for another call, but okay. we're happy to, you know, facilitate a session if you'd like with you. Yeah, that sounds great. I think this is a topic okay. uh, of great interest. I, and, and, I'm, I, and I'm sure the other folks on the, on the call, maybe some of our ONC colleagues, uh, who are working, you know, at the beginning to work more at the cross, you know, the cross domain area would have interest. And Carmen, I think, um, uh, I think you expressed interest in that. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if there are, you know, where that conversation is also happening at the federal or other state levels, um, oh. especially for those systems who are, you know, sort of bumping into that um, from the, you know, different areas. Well, uh, you know, Daniel, you, you, you know that I, I do a lot of work with public health registries, and while they don't necessarily cross domain, uh, you know, when you collect data from clinical care, you could, fair, fair, fairly broadly, you could just as well be from different domains there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's so different. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have a lot of experience collecting data across, across health healthcare. Um, right. uh, you know, and, and 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 I think it's it's more all it's it's more like cross domain than not like it. Uh, I I also paste pasted in into the chat the URL from a a white paper that came out of a community of practice and ONC sponsored community of practice 
that I was involved in a number of years ago. And this, this group actually tried to, to establish or, 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 or define a sort of normative set of, of data that would be most useful uh, for, for, for matching, in, in this case, within the healthcare domain. But look, since a lot of it's demographics, I don't, I don't know that it's dramatically different than any other domain. And it, it addressed it by, by um, uh, describing as, as essentially levels of maturity that if you only had these data elements, you were, you, you, you were sort of less mature, and then as you went up, up, up the line and added more, you were con considered more, more mature. So that, that white paper might, might be a starting point for some conversations. That's right. since it's, well thought out and written up already. That that's great. Uh, no, the, you know the existing resources. You know, we just shook the trees a little bit. And thank you for adding that one. We're 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 adding those to the uh, to the hub, and we'll continue to do that. And we should have our repository up, our searchable repository, in a couple of weeks. So that those those materials should become available uh, for broad for for broadly for uh, for part whoever wants to uh, access them. So just before um, we go forward, Daniel, I wanted to let yeah. you know that at least on my screen, all I'm seeing is black anymore. So I don't know if you're still trying to share screens. Uh, if so, it's not happening. And yeah. I don't know whether Adam has it and could share it or. Let me try again here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, before we move, and we've kind of sort of started to talk about the, the, the next uh, topic, which is the standards, and we've actually been talking about the NEEM and, and FIRE sort of interaction, and we know that there are other standards out there as well. Um, one of the things I want to just uh, ask you uh, to sort of to talk about a little bit, uh, Pradeep or Dave, uh, or Brian, when we were talking the other day in preparation for today's call, we talked about what, the, what you know, how best to, to display this, right? And is it, uh, is it within the context of a use case uh, in terms of the pace of uh, matching? And that we actually, you know, sort of, uh, re sort of reuse the idea of the multiple domains. And, and I think that's what, Nomi, you were talking about in terms of maturity. Uh, you know, if you, if you look at each domain and say, and, and ascribe some of the criteria to those domains in terms of person matching, uh, uh, you know, that might help visualize what we're talking about here as well. And, and would that be of use and value to the field writ large if we could begin to see what person matching looks like from where you stand, whether or not you're standing in the health, uh, you know, from a health organization or education education uh, uh, organization or, or the like. Um, so if you want to elaborate a bit more on that, that would be helpful. Or not. <laughs> so it was interesting. I mean, uh, go ahead, Pradeep. Uh, I was just going to comment. It was interesting. I don't recall who mentioned it uh, a little bit ago, but uh, we often refer to it as cross domain. And I'm sure that as we look a little bit deeper and uh, Elliot, Larry, that crew could probably speak to it in education, but if we think of education as one domain, there are probably uh, at least hundreds of different systems that we would need to be able to do cross-domain matching with. So it's not just the domain in general. Somehow it would seem like uh, if we're going to be forwarding uh, transcriptions, if you will, or other information on a student between school districts, they may have very different systems. So as we look at it, certainly looking at it as a domain is, is one level, but then I'm sure, and Elliot can probably speak to this much better than I, but there's probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of school districts who are needing to share the information as well. And they may not be running the same system. All right. 
Right. Well, I think some some type of visualization uh, of what we're talking about here is probably helpful. Uh, I think so far in our in our sort of uh, research and our discovery process, uh, what we what we found is, uh, or we haven't found the cross domain uh, uh, matching uh, yet. Or if we have, uh, or if it's out there, we haven't we haven't we haven't discovered it yet. And so, in terms of making I'll just wrap this up and then we can move to the uh, to the next next topic here. In order to one of the things we're trying to do with the patient patient matching group or the person matching group is not only sort of uh, explore this topic in greater detail, but also to demonstrate and illustrate what we can do with this larger group. This let's get technical and the Nick in general, which is to focus our attention and resources in in cross domain ways, and to produce something that would be both useful in the content itself but also representing the power of this diversified heterogeneous group of folks coming to the table to address a problem and a, or a challenge that, that really hasn't, again, from our perspective, been you know, adequately addressed in terms of the cross-domain or cross-program mm -hmm. or cross-agency approach. So we want to produce something that people can look at and, and recognize quickly that there's something different here and that there's value to that. And encourage other, uh, you know, other work groups to get started and to uh, sort of contribute in a similar fashion. Um, before we uh, go on, uh, you know, Greg, Greg, are you still here with us on the call, Greg Bloom? Yep. Hello. So, so hey, Greg, you you brought up a topic last week that I, I think might be a great moment just to add that uh, thought into it, uh, so we we have a perspective of all of this you know, client level data that we're talking about matching and, and you know, analyzing and moving forward that I think is really critically important. So if you want to just take a minute here, throw that in and then we can also look at adding that as a topic going forward uh, to go into more detail, okay? Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, by introduction, uh, I lead up the open referral initiative um, and open referral deals with information about health and medical services, but this is, it's public information. So for us, establishing interoperability is just, for the most part, a pure good. Um, but when it comes to personal information, um, we're learning more and more that the uh, prospect of interoperability among systems, especially that deal with vulnerable people and communities, um, there's a lot of potential harm. Um, and that, that harm is not entirely encompassed within the prospect of cyber attacks and hacking or, or, you know, and the harm is not entirely mitigated by individuals consenting to share their information at a given point in time. Um, there's a lot of potential for unanticipated, potentially even lawful uh, harm uh, from different systems being able to share information about vulnerable, vulnerable people in ways that may result in unanticipated uses. So I don't know that this question of essentially abusability, right? Like, I, I think, I think that the matter of abusability should be taken as seriously as the potential for benefit, right? I think we've talked about various edge cases in which interoperability might help someone somewhere. And I think we should take edge cases in which interoperability might harm someone or some community somewhere just as seriously, if not more so. And I'm not sure if this is a technical design consideration. Um, I, it might, there might be aspects of it that have technical design considerations, um, but it certainly is a question of governance. Um, you know, pr presumably among the institutions and communities who are impacted by the increasing integration of these systems with each other. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily have answers to this question. I just figured it was important that somebody be asking it. Absolutely, well, I, I, I think it's an important topic. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with it. You know, I, I almost had an instance of it as I logged on to this conference and somehow it shifted to my phone and I have no idea my phone wasn't even near me. So there's so much linkages of information that's going on in our world today um, it, it becomes scary, like he was saying. I think the only thing that I can see is if we educate ourselves more to understand the potential for abuse and potential ways to secure that data, 
so it is uh it's not abused as opposed to just putting our head in the sand and saying well i don't know how to handle that i think there are ways to handle it uh we need to educate our ourselves on it and we need to expect that there will be abuses and we need to find ways to uh, to punish those people that are abusing. And I think the data use agreements are really important. Um, and typically um, the ones that I've seen um, have limitations on how the data can be used. Um, I don't know what kind of teeth there are to reinforce that, but I, but I think that is really important, that if you're saying that that data can be, just be used for treatment, you know, and you're, um, you're uh, limiting it there. In fact, I'm dealing with sure scripts right now, and I'm trying to get uh, the, the state wants access to prescription data, for example, and sure scripts they can only provide data for treatment purposes and the state doesn't directly treat patients. Um, so they, they're not able to see this data, although they wanna use it to manage um, hepatitis C um, and actually help the physicians. So that's a limitation, but I think that's a positive example of where the data use agreement is doing what it's supposed to do and it's creating those limitations and making people mindful. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Any other reflections on that from part from people on the call here? Okay. So, Greg, I think we'll we'll uh, you know it seems like there's some energy around this. So, one of the things we'll we'll look at as we start to look out over time is uh is you know sort of structuring some part of a conversation around this and and what is being done whether or not it's you know related to data use agreements or or other security kinds of concerns or or just overall how do we approach this because i know we've we've run into this some in terms of even even the open data work right uh there was concern about whether or not it's really de-identified information who's got access to it no less uh trying to uh you know use it to profile communities um, so I think it's an important topic that you, you, you're, you're bringing up here. Cool. Yeah, yeah especially. I mean, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, I think it's just a question for the folks involved here. Like, I'm sure there are some data use agreements out there that are really well crafted, um, and I'm also equally sure that there are going to be instances that were unanticipated, right? That that. Um, uh, and so I think, I think some, of, some of what I'm bringing up is really a more of an institutional design question of how those agreements get designed and modified and, and enforced. Um, but there may be some technical consideration in terms of notification, consent that's not just ongoing, uh, and questions of, resort, of re, a recourse. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm eager to just be listening in, uh, uh, or I have some, you know, paths that I might be able to help connect us. Okay. Yep, that's great. Uh, there's still a little bit of background noise, and I, I'm, I'm wanting not to mute everybody, so if you do have some background noise, um, please go ahead and uh, sort of mute your own phone there, or I'll, or I'll take the drastic action to, uh, to limit everybody. Um, but I think this part flows directly into the, into the very kind of, which you've talked about a little bit, which is around uh, the date, you know, the, the standards question that we've had. Uh, or we've been having around um, both uh, both uh, the NEEM work and then around uh, the FIRE work and the HL7 work. And then we got a little bit of introduction to that last week on education. Um, and, and so maybe uh, Dave or Brian, um, you want to just add a little um, context around where we're at on that. Uh, I know that there's, I think Mary Sarah offered uh, to sort of bring uh, you know, their perspective to the table on Sonoma and L.A., but it might be interesting to just to hear, you know, how you guys are thinking about it as well. Sure. Do you want to take it, Brian, or you want me to take it? Well, uh, I was to tell you what. I'll lead off, and and you can provide okay. detail. Okay, sounds good. I, I, what we, what we have been talking about in the past was putting together some type of a proof of concept for uh, a name to fire bridge uh, that would, of course, involve. Uh, 
mapping uh, healthcare information to name information and vice versa. Um, and targeting as the first uh, proof of concept implementation, the notion of uh, patient slash client matching. I yield to you, Dave. Okay. So uh, one of the things that we have been talking about, and I don't know, Daniel, uh, whether your screen is currently showing or not. I think, yeah, I think it's still a black screen. Uh, mm -hmm. is, it, is it easy to pass the screen control to me? Because I've got a slide that I could talk about this with a little bit. Oh, let, or me, if that's let, me, let, no, let me see if I can do that. Maybe, that. maybe you have more bandwidth and allow you to do that. I'm going to give yep. you the remote control here. Um, Dave, it should, you should see a little uh, something on your side now that allows you to grab it. Hopefully that will be good. Um, all right, let me see. No, it still says I'm viewing SOC screen. Yeah. Let me try one more time. I may not, uh, I apologize. It's the bandwidth here is not great. Yeah. Well, if you wave your arm well, a bit more, maybe we'll understand this. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so what we've really looked at um, is coming from the healthcare domain in general, there is, uh, and I, I uh, uh, there is the fire standard that's getting a lot of attention at this point. If you look at the fire standard, it really breaks down into a couple of pieces. One is about the data. How do we represent the data that we're going to be sharing? But then a lot of it uh, addresses the transport. How do we get information from point A to point B? in a secure manner using HTTPS and so forth. But then there are other pieces in the work, something generally known as smart on fire. And smart on fire really helps you um, uh, authenticate who the user is that's going to be using the application, accessing the data, and secondarily, what they are allowed to do with that data. Are they allowed to update it? Are they allowed to um, uh, delete it, create a new record, those kinds of things. So if we separate those two pieces out where we've got the data model as the information that's being transported, and then we've got the transport and the security mechanisms that allow you to, in a pretty fine, in a very fine-grained method, say, uh, Brian is not allowed access to this record. And that occurs uh, back up on the server and an exchange of information that uses tokens to say, hey, I'm Dave Walsh and I want to do this. And therefore, the fire server says you either are or are not allowed to go do that. So when we look at the cross-domain work, whether it be uh, NEEM or some other mechanism, and I think we all have to be aware that uh, uh, information technology is going at a tremendous pace, and there will be other formats other than just NEEM and FIRE going forward. So if we're able to separate, hey, here's the data that's being exchanged, and then apply technologies that secure that data on a record by record basis, then we could reuse that transportation or transport uh, information and the security mechanisms to be able to share that information across domain. So and Dave, I'd, the, I'd, I'd add to that, that uh, in addition to the record by record, um, uh, authorization uh, mm -hmm. at the NEEM Technical Architects uh, Council. We're now working on uh, how do we turn around and include marking that would allow you to con to uh, provide guidance for uh, element by element, field by field uh, uh, authorization access to 
uh, data because you may be allowed, for instance, to see in general a, a human services record or a patient record, uh, but you may not be allowed to see their uh, substance abuse um, uh, information. Or yep. if there's somebody in a in a, an emergency shelter, you may not be able to see their address because they're being protected from right. an abuser. Right. Yep. Right. So so good point. But I think in general, um, what we've got to recognize is the world isn't going to be uh, one way. And in healthcare, fire seems to be the up and coming bright new star. Uh, we can almost predict from history that that will change. Uh, it used to be XML, now it's JSON, who's the darling of how we, uh, how we render information or how we make information available. So I think one of the things that we can do is A, look at the various domains as we go through touching domain by domain and try and look for the most likely information or the most valuable information to be able to exchange with that domain. So collect on a domain by domain basis, what are the pieces of information that would be the most relevant and then separate those data elements from how you share them and utilize technologies like is being used in fire to transport that information from point a to point b so i think uh, you know that follows nicely with some discussions that we've had on having um, uh, some of the weekly calls be focused on a specific domain and maybe we can start to gather what are the really crucial elements that we want to share with those domains. And then a, uh, an effort uh, on every other week to talk about some infrastructure to be able to share that data. And I've got a background as a software developer and would certainly see the value in making it as easy as practicable for developers to uh, be able to share that data without having to get all mired into, hey, it's all different, we use different protocols. So if we can uh, identify a mechanism for sharing that information more easily and then pinpointing what are the pieces of information in the domains, I think we may be able to make some good progress. And Dave is the author of the idea of Neem on Fire, being able to use the Fire protocol for exchanging Neem messages. And I floated that with the Neem Architect, Architects, uh, Technical Architects Council. And uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. So uh, I think uh, the next step is we need to get a prototype of uh, a, a Neem on Fire implementation in order to uh, really get the Neem community excited about this idea. Yeah, that'd be great. I think I'm a big, big fan of prototypes or proof of concepts so you can get past the talking levels and see what actually does work and doesn't work. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. We can always refactor later. There you go. Sorry for all of you non-software people. <laughs> So Dave, that was a that was a a a, a, um, a soft uh, a pitch for potentially another work group on the Neem and Fire work together, um, which I think uh, we've been uh, kicking around here. So yes. uh, if I got that right, I think that's uh, that maybe worthwhile the energy around this particular topic. You got it exactly right, Dan. Yep. Right. Let's do it. So, uh, one comment that uh, the president a couple of us. Daniel, we're losing you. You're breaking up. Okay. Um, so what I'm saying is that there's not a lot of slides here on this on this uh, on this presentation, but all the other ones from the other meetings we've had are the education. Uh, 
TEFCA and the, uh, the data standards uh, are actually uh, the whole record is available. Let me let's let's uh, switch gears. Let me hand it over. Uh, Dome, you, uh, can you give us a brief overview of the TEF? Try to connect some of the dots here. Um, and I thank you for stepping yeah. in uh, last moment for that. Yeah, I'll 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 try to give you uh, TEFCA on the head of a pin. Uh, <laughs> I, I just pasted into the chat. Uh, the, the main ONC page where you can read lots of stuff, stuff, stuff about this. So TESCA stands for Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Ag Ag Agreement. It is an initiative uh, that, uh, that comes out of the 21st Century Cures Act. Uh, it is, it, but but it, it is not rulemaking the way that we've seen some of the CMS uh, and and o, o and C rule rule rulemaking rule that have come out of meaning, meaningful use and the EHR incentive program uh, now called promoting interoperability. Um, the reason it's important is because uh, TESCA and what flows from it are are potentially poised to be a sort of major um, organizing factor for healthcare, and since we're talking about cross-domain cross interoperability, it, it, it will therefore affect other domains that, um, that want either access to data from the healthcare domain or to provide data to the healthcare domain. The, the effort uh, has a number of, 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 of parts, but the overall goal it's a, it, which 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 goes way back to to some of the 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 earlier principles and thoughts of the High Tech Act way 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 back ten years ago uh, is is in fact to try to to develop um, a, a a a nationwide network of networks to allow the the, the appropriate flow of Healthcare and in, in information between any two points on that network. Uh, TESCA does that by uh, right now by by defining three things that are very much in draft form. Uh, there's a set of principles that describe sort of what this is all about and what 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 it's trying to accomplish. There's a set of required terms and, and, and conditions which are proposed, um, which is a, a way to essentially define what the rules of the road are for various types of actors within this, this system. And then there's a technical framework, which, which was now in its present draft, uh, a, a re revised attempt to describe how technically this network of networks might 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 work. Um, just a couple of other points because there's, there's really too 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 much here to say. Too much more. Um, critical to the further development and implementation of TESCA is the designation of a single organization to function as essentially the coordinating. Uh, or organization for this activity. Uh, in TEFCA, it's called uh, a, a, a recognized coordinating entity, or, or RCE. There was an open competition uh, for, uh, uh, for or, 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 or organizations to apply to be funded by, by, by ONC as an RCE. And in fact, the Sequoia project a week or two ago uh, was 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 named as the winner of that um, uh, uh, of, of of that that funding. Uh, so with an, an an RCE now being being named, um, hopefully the the momentum behind TEFCA will even pick up even more uh, because now there's there's an organization which has really been re retained to, to develop uh, the, the, the final versions of, of the architecture uh, and terms and, and, and 
conditions, the rules of the road, and see them through to ex 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 execution. And we all hope that there will be a lot of community engagement. So one thing that might be important, particularly, and I'll, and I'll finish with, with this, uh, as, as, as the RCE is, 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 is de determining its, its process for engaging the stakeholder community, I think it would be very important that folks from other domains uh, who are rep represented around our virtual table who are interested in exchanging data one way or the other with the healthcare domain, but who might not otherwise be exposed to testing because it's just sort of outside of their, their world. I think it would be very important that we encourage the RCE to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to have these other domains participate as, as stakeholders because often they're, they're not thought of as, as stakeholders from other domains. I'll stop there and uh, happy to have whatever discussion, Daniel, you, you feel that there's time for. Sure, I'd open it up. I think we, we talked about this a little bit last time, which was how do we bring the voice of the other domains to TASCA uh, while it is still in formation and draft form. And um, I mentioned that uh, Sequoia, when we first set up the NIC, uh, Sequoia and Marianne Yeager in particular said, yeah, I'm, I'm part of it, uh, wanted to join it. Uh, you know, the question is activating that. And uh, so you know, we, can, we can try to bring our voice to the table there. Um, for others on the call who may have uh, part, be part of the RCE or part of or connected to Sequoia or the uh, or TEFCA in general, it would be interesting to hear from you if, you if you have any thoughts as to whether or not those ideas are actually being uh, or you're hearing a conversation about that, uh, and if not, you know, you know, how do we let, let's move forward on it, or what perspective is there about moving forward? Um, so, well, right now there's really no conversation at all. So, so, so where this was last left is that a a second version of the draft TEFCA documents was was released earlier in the year. There's a a public comment period, and we all submitted stuff. Um, at the same time, there was this competitive procurement for the okay. coordinating okay. entity. That's now come completed. So we're just sort of waiting to see what's going to happen now. So at some point, the, the, the RCE will will start something, and we we don't know what that is that it's going to start. Right. Right. I'm just listening for if anyone has uh, other thoughts about uh, about about what uh, Noam just said uh, or how best to approach um, uh, RCE on this. I I think it, this is Marshally. I think it's also helpful to know that there have been working groups in clusters of organizations, and ENAC is one of them that has comprised a, a good list of organizations in the healthcare sector with different roles and putting together what they believe would be a, a way to move forward that could then also be certified and accredited. So although the ONC just named Sequoia Project as the R R R R RNC, so they'll be the governing body of it, there's been a great deal of work already from many industry leaders looking at what could productively be done to create the trust credentials to allow for covered and non-covered entities to communicate with a single on-ramp. Great. This is Rita. Um, I just have a, a question. Um, anyone on the on, on today's call involved with drafting comments um, on TEFCA, either the first or second round um, that um, was part of the, I think, over 100 comments that ONC received. Because I know I did when my most recent role with you and, it, and, when, and, my, and the comments that I, that I helped draft related actually to patient matching. But I was curious as to whether anyone else on the call had also drafted comments. Yeah, I was involved in drafting comments of my own and with a whole set of public health or, or, or organizations and activities as well as in Amy and the, the American Medical Informatics Association and him. So right. I, I was very involved in this. 
So do you, would it be would it be useful to sort of like um, learn um, or share what we what we as commenters on this call today kind of spoke to or, or brought? That's something that would be of interest. Well, all, all, the, all, the, all the comments are posted publicly. In fact, I read all of them. Sort of a blur now, but 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 they they are all all there. Uh, big big and small, right? Every, everything from a paragraph to a fifty-page tome. There's other vast 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 no. range. So, so I I also so I, I found it very interesting, frankly. I found it interesting, and I also wrote, wrote comments. I'm very interested in your what you wrote um, from Pew because you spent so much time in the patient matching place already. So I would be. I think the rest of this group would enjoy some of the outcomes of what you have learned from Pew around this topic. Um, sure, Marsley. So I'm just. I'm going to be pretty brief, um, but it's, I'm just going to focus on the piece that specifically at least some of the pieces that specifically touch on, pa on patient or person matching, which is the, the core um, topic of, or one of the core topics of this group and call. Um, because the, the, the TEFCA, TEFCA has the, I think what they call the technical quality framework. Maybe Carmen can, knows about it, be, you know, being from ONC, although Carmen, I don't know if you've actually done much um, with TEFCA, but the TEFCA proposal or what they define in the, I think the technical quality framework was based on IHP standards, and I think I, I may have talked to one of, some of you about this. Is that they they find some very basic um, data elements as what they what they use what they are using right now under the IHE, um, but using the IHE protocols, and I and then those are really pretty much limited to like I think three or four elements with first name, last name, date of birth, and maybe one other thing. But I think it's just three. And so in terms of like perhaps how the group can engage with the RCE with Sequoia when they start actually like, you know, holding community meetings is sort of like trying to inform, you know, maybe what they're looking at from the perspective of like what's going on with those standards or if they're going to be trying to influence any, any um, changes to those things to either incorporate more and more like data elements that might also be relevant to other domains matching and those things. The things that I see as a way to, to elevate the, the discussion. And I don't know if, what, what other people have thoughts on with, with regards to that. I, I think it's right that the, the technical framework was fairly IHE-ish. Uh, a number of us in our comments, and I, I also participated on a, a, work, a work group uh, of, of, of uh, that ONC can convene to, to provide comments as well. Um, a number of us were actually a little concerned that the technical framework was very IAG-ish and not very FIRE-ish when other parts of particularly ONC rulemaking that was happening right around the same time this past spring was very much pushing FIRE. The, the technical framework here for TEFCA really doesn't talk much about FIRE at all doesn't frankly talk much about matching in a, in a terribly useful way, to be honest. Um, uh, the, 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 the work group that I was on um, actually recommended that, and, 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 and if you read the, the, the technical framework closely, it does say that there is an expectation that the RCE will sort of craft this technical framework and that what was presented as draft, both in the first and second version, was really meant to sort of be almost an idea of, of how this could go, but uh, but but ONC really seems to be ex expecting um, um, the, uh, the 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 RCE to sort of take 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 that and run. The last comment that I'll make, because you raised this notion about IHE, is I do sort of raise an eyebrow a little at the Sequoia project because um, they're in fact very IHE-ish in the other, the, the, the other projects, the e-health e, e, e exchange, care equality, that, that sort of fall under their, their broad umbrella. So I'm, I'm a little concerned as those of us who 
who were con concerned about the IHE ishness of TEFCA, the RCE that's been selected is now a very IHE ish organization, if I could characterize them that way. And, and, and I don't think that's a coincidence, frankly. I agree. Did, did you see any comments about other other domains like education or social or public safety in there? Or uh, nothing that I recall in particular. But I don't know that I was looking with through that lens, you know. Yeah, yeah, that might be interesting to see about that and and the follow up there. That's great. A any other questions or comments on Tefka? Thank you, Noam, for that. Uh, uh, comprehensive and and succinct presentation about it. All right. So um, we just have a little bit of time left. Uh, I did want to give Marcelli just a few moments, if you feel like it's uh, appropriate. Now, just to say just a couple of high level things on the education side, because what's occurring to me is, you know, we've got data standards, we've got person matching, we've got Tefka sort of setting out the, the framework for things that are going to affect us for a long time. Education is affecting how many kids in the country? <laughs> 52 million people or something of that nature? Um, and are there any data standards and considerations that we ought to be thinking about there as well? Marcy, do you have a few words to say for us? Yes, well, in the education space, and we have some educators here, in the education space, we're dealing with the same issues around what's expected. Some people could call it from outcomes of care, but in education it would be the academic standards. Then we fight over these two same things that happens in healthcare, which is the data standard itself, meaning what is included in it. So what is the, the dictionaries and the, the words that we use and how we organize it, and that gives us meaning. And then there's the technical standards. So what needs to be connected with the packets and the protocols and the data exchanges? So in the education space, there's not as wide a variety as I've seen in healthcare, or there's not um, the investment either. There are, education is a huge market. Healthcare itself is the, when things go wrong in healthcare, it's a very big expense and a high liability. So when healthcare gets involved, high business risks sometimes then tilt the conversations and that's how we get from a patient centered to a, you know, we, we might start out with people and whole person care, but then it turns into patient and patient care. And, and I think that's because the risks of mishandling health information is so much greater in every possible way, particularly financial fines than it is with education. So in education, we have a, a group of companies that provide different types of services depending on what needs to go back to the state or what goes back to the federal organizations. And there's a handful of um, different integrators. And this is where it's quite different than in healthcare or in human services because schools have similarities. They don't have similar capacities, but they have similarities in what's expected there is a series, about three or four big companies that do the integration. So they'll have the school information system and maybe they'll do the, the student registry. And that's going to be a small amount of information about the students. Overall, education data is very rich in bringing context for what a family's life is like. And oh, I, I appreciate the comments about how important it is that we're very careful with what gets combined because historically we already know whatever can be known is then used by companies, for example, the insurance companies. And what I mean specific, specific about that is the, the state of California cannot manage or understand what prescriptions are filled to track hepatitis, hepatitis, hepatitis C. But every night, every pharmaceutical Every prescription filled every day is updated in a system created pulling people's individual HIPAA request when they sign for insurance. So when you've signed on an insurance form, it means that you've signed a HIPAA request 
and every single prescription you've filled your entire life is on this database. And it is used to, with, to change how you receive insurance, and it, uh, there's a lot of business decisions, many decisions, and things that directly impact families by how this data is used. So this brings me back to this concept of schools are dealing with low resource budgets. And, and this came about because the federal communications, FCC, provides E-rate funds, which funds the actual communication technology itself. And none of that money to date, there's, a, there's some efforts now to try to change that with some new rules. None of that can be used for cybersecurity or for student privacy. So it means we have little bits of rogue systems and uh, not a lot of oversight and there's very little enforcement. Actually, I would say almost no enforcement in K-12 because the Department of Education is the enforcer. And in K-12, it's, um, it's, it's never been enacted because it means that all federal funds would be withdrawn from a school. So there's some pr problematic issues around student data and the interoperability of it on its own. There's also some tremendous opportunities for communities to come together. And even if it's only to help create more confidence in verifying the identity of an individual, particularly a pediatric patient or a young person receiving human services, it can change our capacity to meet and Imp uh, understand and improve the social determinants of a community. So it, it, I, I, it sounds like I've wandered around quite a bit, but in reality, it means that if you set aside the academic standards, there's still the data standards and the technical standards that have similar challenges in education that you experience in human service and you particularly experience in healthcare. The data standards themselves, I, I, I will send in the link of this. There's a really wonderful library of the data standards put together by a recent project, the Unicorn Project. There's a very good paper that was done by Red Brandt that lists how they fit together. And then I'll send also in this chat window a visual from a, um, it's, a it's a paper and a resource that list, shows you where all of these things fit together in where the data and the, so data standards and the, techno, the technical standards overlap. Does this make sense when I'm talking about a data standard is really, uh, it's, it's the words we use and how we identify what's, what we have and then the technical is how it actually moves on a network on, with different protocols and di different actual technical standards. Personally, I think that would probably be interesting and worthwhile to have in the repository as we begin to look more, again, more intentionally across the domains and looking for commonalities and differences uh, and, and both highlighting that and then thinking about ways to actually bridge that, whether or not it's in a thing like TEF, which may or may not make sense, or in other kinds of uh, other kinds of uh, policies uh, that are coming out in terms of interoperability, uh, and and I know there's some bunch of initiatives that are that are out there. Um, so being able to bring that attention to uh, to the uniqueness of education as it relates to social determinants, which is you know certainly growing in momentum, I think would be really helpful. So I'll put thank you, thank you for that. Window, and it'll give you some visuals. It'll also help you realize. Uh, the opportunity to be able to work with integrators like Gigi Farrell. Um, there's the, the mega standards are going to be the EdFi, IMS Global, and uh, the FDA for all. It's a smaller network, and there's fewer people uh, to be able to execute on large but thin. And then schools are wide and diverse. So there is a place where there could be some helpful not requiring much, but a little bit that could, could drastically help and improve those communities that are working with families. Thank you very much. Sounds, sounds great.
Um, I know that when we uh, when we get into some more of the social and human services aspects of of interoperability, that you know, education is such an important role. It may not be as obvious in the in the in the health or even the public health sectors, but when it starts to come to you know foster care, TANF program, behavioral health programs, there just an enormous overlap, and so the the requirements of being able to integrate and share data become really 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 paramount. Um, it, so that'll become something. It, it's outside of just oh, social human services. It's also workforce services. So workforce right. services has determined if I do, if, they, if families have wraparound services, everyone's successful. It, everything gets better. So having access to being able to understand who's in a household and the dynamics of the language and there are the amount of information that schools have on families, it's, it's incredible. It's much more than healthcare. Yeah. It, it also includes healthcare. Right. Surprising. Well, let me uh, thank you for that. And I think we need to keep that in consideration as we do this. Um, I, I don't know if you see my screen now or not, but um, um, there we're building out a. So let me let me just kind of wrap that, or just ask if there's any questions to Marcelie or any other comments folks want to make around the education or the integration with with other other domains. I'd love to hear from our new, new education folks. Um, um, okay. So, um, so what what I uh, what we're starting to put together here is a series over the next two months uh, of different, uh, both as Dave mentioned, sort of presentations and kind of framework conversations. So we're lining up, and we're just now sort of locking down some of these based on our prior conversations. So if you can see my screen, you'll see that, you know, we're, we're talking about public safety and public health. Uh, in particular, we're also looking at the Family First Act, uh, which is, you know, huge for the, uh, the child welfare world. Um, um, uh, and then uh, the other thing that we've in, have been in, have been exploring is uh, Dave Ross, who runs the Public Health uh, uh, Public Health Informatics Institute, and is leading the Gates Foundation Global Health Initiative, uh, we're talking about sort of interoperability outside of the U.S. and what they're doing relative to uh, actually a, a less sophisticated technology framework and infrastructure uh, framework was fascinating. So to get a little perspective from outside the U.S. and what can be done, uh, we've talked about uh, asking Marianne or Representative Sequoia to come talk, uh, and Dave had uh, reached out to a couple of folks on the Gravity Project, which is addressing the um, uh, social determinants from a coding perspective. Um, and you can say a little bit more about that. And then there are a couple of other topics uh, that we're, you know, we're, we're looking at um, in terms of, you know, trying to get a full perspective on, on the various domains and then how these things begin to integrate with. So certainly very open to ideas. And I think one of the things we'll do is we'll, you know, make it clear that we're looking for suggestions or recommendations uh, for other topics or sort of reinforcing these topics in terms of a level of interest. And then how do we actually integrate them into this larger perspective, this cross-domain perspective? Is there any any reflection, response to that, or ideas that just been out at you? Dave, this is Christine McCoy. A couple weeks ago, I brought up the integrated care for kids, and yeah. just wondered if there was any, you know, interest in kind of moving forward um, with looking at that a little more carefully before the projects get started um, in January. Well, I think I think that would be fantastic. I mean, that's going right at the the core of the issue of interoperability between right CMS and and uh, ACF and Children's Services, um, and uh, and probably criminal justice to a certain degree, right? With with opioids as a focus there. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I, I think that would be fantastic to add that in, and we we just need to identify someone who would be you know willing and able to speak to that for us or with us. Um, uh, both e either out of ACF or out of uh, out of CMS, and if you have a recommendation, that would be great. I wish I did. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, good question. 
That's okay. We can we can find that. We we have some relationships inside. Uh, okay. And I, and I know that some folks are doing that, but we can certainly add that to the to the list. And it, your your point about it starting in January would probably be a great great uh, good timing to get that started now to be tracking what's going on there. Do, do you know if they've selected the the pilot sites yet? No, the um, the awards are December first. Okay. Great. Fantastic. Um, okay, thanks. Is, Any other? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. We, I thought I thought we had also um, uh, talked or thought about um, um, inviting the the fast um, technical community to to talk about particularly the identity tiger team that's working on the. Um, the component that relates to, to patient matching. Um, Carmen, Carmen has been involved with that too more closely and, and I'm trying to get educated and so I don't know if what your thoughts are on that or, or Carmen what you think of that. Sure we'd be happy anybody really from the work group is welcome um, but I'm one of the leads I'm happy to provide a short presentation on it. Uh, it's essentially uh, utilizing fire to connect uh, payers to healthcare providers. Um, surprisingly, hasn't really been done successfully in the past. And so, uh, and yes, oh, and one more suggestion on the public health front, uh, the immunization people, I'm sure they have a formal name to their division, uh, have been dealing with record linkage for many decades. Uh, and I do have a few contacts, so I'll, I'll email them to you. Yeah, that's, that's a world I'm heavily involved in. I've been working on immunization registries for 20, 25 years. So that's my, my core area of activity. And yeah, I've actually posted some, some resources, even some going way back to uh, 2006, even, even earlier, about record matching and linking from that, that, that community. We'll call on you there as well. Any other uh, last thoughts? We don't, we don't close the door, just uh, for this particular call. Um, any other uh, suggestions or recommendations? Okay, but well, we have plenty of topics um, uh, going forward, and I think that one of the things we'll we'll want to do is think a little bit more about what the right order might be, and how we uh, how we sequence those things so we sort of continue to build on our our learning and our thinking. Uh, and trying to integrate that and then trying to demonstrate that or sort of actually uh, either publish something around that or or create some ways of being able to share the thinking that's going on that would be useful for folks both in the group and outside the group. So Daniel, any, I wanted whoop. Go ahead. I want to jump in for just 30 seconds and say that we're going to put this list together because we want to be responsive and and be discussing things that everyone um, is interested in and things that are important. But we're all, we also want, we are going to be flexible because a couple of times during the course of these meetings, organically topics have come up that one of which led to a project and another led to a second week of discussion and we will be flexible on that. So as you think about what should we be discussing, it isn't, you know, a, a, a firm final list. Uh, we very much want to get ongoing input so that we're responsive to to uh, the conversations as they take place. Thanks, Adam. That's great. Well, okay. Well, thank you. I hope uh, new folks are taking to the to the call. Um, you got some insights into what we're doing. It's a little bit different than the prior calls we've had. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, Look for uh, notification for next week, and we'll publish the at least the tentative schedule or some thinking around that. And of course, as always, you know, invite your thoughts and comments on the hub and questions or comments. And we'll post whatever. I'm not sure what how much of this uh, audio or video will be intact given the on and off nature of Zoom here. Uh, but if it's worthwhile, we'll put it up on the hub, and uh, you'll hear from us real soon. And uh, we'll we've taken some notes, and we'll we'll add the ideas that we have to that and. And we'll look forward to continuing the conversation going forward. So with that, have a great weekend, everybody. And thanks for joining the call. See you uh, next week. Thank yeah, you, thanks, Daniel. everybody. Daniel? Have a good weekend. Yep. Thank you. Safe travels, all. Bye-bye.